And tonight, if you have your Bibles, I want to speak to you on the subject of the caliber of the called. The caliber of the called. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. When you have it, say, I am called by God. And it reads like this. It says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. How many of you, when you read that, something lights up in your spirit? Should I read it again? It's talking about the Lord's gifts. It said, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Look at, look at why. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. How many love scriptures like that? Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and tell them, God has given you a calling and a gift. You may be seated. On Wednesday night, we've been talking about the call of God. How many have been enjoying it? Great crowd tonight. I can tell that many of you are interested in this topic. Because I believe that when you talk about the call of God, you're, you're talking about something very serious. You're talking about something that can make a difference in the lives of people. I came across this little story the other day about a little country town with a country church and a country preacher. And it says when the new preacher came to town, everybody at the church was talking about how good he was and how much better he was than their old preacher who passed away. The church skeptic, how many know there's always one church skeptic? <laughs> He's like, that's not me. <laughs> the church skeptic asks what this new man was preaching and what, what had made him so different than their old preacher. He said, the old preacher told us we were all lost sinners, and unless we repented, we were going to hell. He says, so what does this new preacher say that makes him so special, the skeptic, skeptic asked. And someone said, this new preacher tells us we are all lost sinners. And unless we repent, we're all going to hell. <laughs> so the skeptic says, well, I can't tell the difference. It sounds like the same message to me. And the man said, oh, there's a big difference. This preacher says it with tears in his eyes. Somebody say breakthrough. breakthrough. See, why does God place a calling on a man or a woman's life? I'll tell you why. Because God wants to break people through. And how many know that if you are called by God and called to be a leader before you can break others through, you must learn to break through yourself. I truly believe with all my heart that if you've been called by God, God has called you to be broken before he can use you. Come on, somebody. You see, God calls us because the spirit of God wants to bring revival to the land. I don't know why God chose man. He could have chose angels. He could have chose anything. But I get the feeling that God chose man because we have what the world needs. We, we have a heart. We have emotions. We have feelings. Think about your leadership. Think about your Christianity. Think about your walk with God. Do you move with heart? Oh, come on. Talk to me a little bit. See, God wants to bring revival through a people with heart. He wants to raise up a ministry that will advance his kingdom. And how many know to be a part of Victory Outreach is not only to be a part of the overall kingdom of God, but how many know within the kingdom of God, God's given us a special mission that God says, I've raised up the ministry of Victory Outreach to advance my kingdom to the inner cities of the world. I've raised up the ministry of Victory Outreach not to reach the easiest places. You ain't saying nothing to me. But how many know God says, I'm sending Victory Outreach to the difficult places. I'm sending my ministry into the places where hearts are most hard and minds are, are most, mo most locked down and lives are most damaged. But how many know that when God has called you, he gives you something called a breakthrough spirit? How many know what it is to experience a Holy Ghost breakthrough within your life? See, I believe this. I believe that the people who are called by God are called to be a people of caliber, a people of caliber. 
I've worked with guns my whole life. I've, I owned my first gun when I was nine years old. It was a little Beretta 25 caliber. Come on, somebody. I remember it was so small, and my hands were so small, and I, and I would shoot it, and when the hammer would go back, it'd make my hand bleed. But I've always had guns. And one thing I've learned about guns is that guns have different calibers. One thing I've learned about leaders is that leaders have different calibers. One thing I've learned about people is people have different calibers. What caliber are you tonight? You see, a gun has a different caliber for a different purpose. If you want to blow up something big, you better make sure you got the right ammunition. Are you with me here tonight? But if you're only looking to do a little bit of damage, you don't need huge ammunition because every weapon has a different caliber. There are small caliber weapons and there are large caliber weapons, each for a specific purpose. So I want to make this clear to you tonight is that if you feel called by God and you feel called into the ministry, I want to make it clear to you that you must carry a particular caliber within your life. Depending on the mission that God has given you, there are people here in this place that you feel stirring in your heart. There are people that feel a stirring to take a city. There are people that feel a stirring to help build the ministry. There are people that feel, take, feel a stirring to take the gifts that God has given them and begin to use those gifts for God's glory. As I was studying the gifts of God, there are a minimum of 18 gifts in the Bible. Look at your neighbor, tell them, you have a gift. Those of you that have been in the family life flow, you've learned about the gifts. You, we, we teach about the gifts of God. But in, in the scripture, there are a minimum of 18 gifts. And I came to tell you, not one of you is here empty handed. Every single one of us has a gift. Every single one of us has something that God has given us, whether it's developed in the house of God or whether God gave it to us in birth. Come on, somebody. But we're not empty handed. He's poured out gifts. He's poured out talents. He's poured out abilities. But what we need is we need to grow up concerning the call. We may have a gift, but we've got to grow the gift. Tell your neighbor, you've got to grow the gift. Here in the scripture, I, I, I read to you about five important gifts to build a breakthrough ministry. What I really believe with all my heart that if this church is going to go to another level, what I, what I believe with all my heart is if you're going to take a city, what I believe with all my heart is if you're going to leave this place and go to another city or another country or maybe even another continent, you need to be acquainted and knowledgeable about these five gifts. I call these the power gifts. Ooh, come on, somebody. Now, maybe you're here tonight, you're not interested in having power. But is anybody that says, man, God has called me and know that I can't do it without the power of God in my life? Come on, give God a praise if you understand what I'm talking about tonight. In, in the scripture, it says he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I, I want you to tune into this tonight, the apostle. What is the role of the apostle? Well, the role of the apostle is to govern in the ministry. The apostle is a powerful office. If, if, if. All the five gifts are on the hand. The apostle is the thumb. And I'll tell you why it's a thumb, because your thumb can touch the four other gifts. If God has called you to be an apostle, come on, somebody, you're called to pioneer. You're called to prophesy. You're called to evangelize. See, that's the long one because the evangelist reaches out. You're called to pastor. That's the ring finger because it's connected to your heart. And you're called to teach. And the teach is the smallest gift because it goes deep. <laughs> you know what I think of an apostle as? I think of an apostle as a visionary leader. What is going to cause the ministry to grow and to explode is when we begin to see an apostolic spirit cultivated in the lives of leaders. The apostle governs, he casts the vision, he possesses the greatest amount of faith. I, I, I hear somebody, people always talking about the calling of God, but my question is, do you have any faith? Do you have the faith to move mountains? Do you have the faith to believe for the impossible? Do you have the faith to make something out of nothing? The apostle can make something out of nothing. 
Come on, somebody. See, he demonstrates also the heart and the strategy of the vision God has given him. And the apostle's powerful. Someone say the apostle's powerful. The apostle's powerful because he brings breakthrough wherever he goes. God told Joshua, wherever you set your foot, I'm going to give you that territory. Come on, somebody. And the apostle of God brings breakthrough wherever he goes. The second power gift, are you with this so far? Is the prophet. Where the apostle governs the ministry and leads the ministry, the prophet guides the ministry. The prophet is raised up within the vision. On Sunday, I, I talked to you about catching a vision within the vision, didn't I? And often the prophet understands his role within the vision. He understands that his message that God has given him is to complement the vision of the apostle. And that prophet does all he can to work within the vision, the vision of God for his people. What the prophet is, watch this, is the prophet is a powerful voice, a powerful voice. Often a prophet is a loud leader. So if you're a quiet guy, chances are you're not a prophet. But a prophet is not afraid to stand up and to speak the heart of God to the people. The prophet is not afraid to move in the boldness of the Holy Ghost. Often it's the prophet that will offend you. Come on, somebody. I, I know there's been times when I've preached and people have been so offended. And they're offended because I'm operating in the gift of the prophet. It was the prophets that called the nations to repent. It was the prophets that called the people to turn from their wicked ways. It was the prophets that said, you got to change if you want revival. And I believe that God is raising up some prophets here in San Diego that have the vision, that aren't afraid to be a powerful voice for God. See, the job of the prophet is to direct everybody towards the vision. Ask your neighbor, are you moving towards the vision? You know what the prophet is? This is powerful. The prophet is not a maintainer. The prophet's a breaker. Ooh, man. How are we going to take cities? We can't take it with maintainers. How are we going to take Chula Vista? How are we going to take El Cajon? How are we going to take Sacramento? How are we going to take these different cities that God has called us to? We're not going to take them with maintainers. We're not going to take them with sheepish people. We're not going to take them with people that are conservative. Mm. Some of you are like, this is way over my head, but is there anyone with me here tonight? We're not going to take them with polite people. We're not going to take them with people who say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Come on, somebody. We need some breakers to rise up in this church. We need some breakers to rise up in this church. Come on and clap in this place. The third power gift is the evangelist. The evangelist. The prophet governs the, I mean, excuse me, the apostle governs, the, the prophet guides powerfully. But you know what the evangelist does? He gathers. He gathers. The evangelist is the hands and the feet that reach out to make the vision go. The evangelist is the one that goes into the highways and the hedges. The evangelist is the one that is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The evangelist is the one that says, give me souls lest I die. The evangelist is the one that is not afraid to go into dark places. Not afraid to go into the prison cells. Not afraid to go into the juvenile hall. Not afraid to go into the halfway houses. Not afraid to go into the alleys. Not afraid to go into the gang neighborhoods. Not afraid to go into the drug infested neighborhoods. Not afraid to stop what he's doing to let someone know that Jesus is the answer and Jesus can change life. I wonder if there's any evangelists in this place tonight. The evangelist is a man or a woman with a radical faith. I'm talking about the call of God. And as I begin to share these things, I know that there's a fire lighting up inside of you. There's a fire lighting up inside of you because you feel the call of God. But you don't know specifically what God has called you to do. But the evangelist has a radical faith. The evangelist is willing to go where others won't go, do what others won't do, and, and make things happen the way that other people will not make it happen. 
I got to tell you, unless you're willing to do that, you'll never be an effective evangelist. But if God has called you to be an evangelist, you need a radical faith. You need a radical willingness. You need a radical passion for souls. You need to weep for souls. You'll never evangelize until you agonize. I'm trying to teach you about the calling of God. You'll never reap a harvest you've never prayed for. Third wave, hear me and hear me clear. You'll never grow a ministry you have not weeped over. If there's no tears in your preaching, you'll have no effect. If there's no tears in your life, if you are not broken for the condition of hurting people, if you are not broken, if you're, if you're more busy performing and you're more busy being polished, I came to tell you, we don't need polished preachers. We need power preachers. We need preachers who pray. We need preachers who weep. We need preachers who toil. We need worship people that sing unto the Lord and are broken in the presence of God and know what it is to access his presence because if they can access their presence, they can lead us into his presence. Am I in the right church here tonight? We need some people... We need some people that are willing to go through the fire of God. I'm preaching good tonight. You like when I say that, huh? If you want to make a weapon, you need fire. And if there's no fire in the church, weapons can't be made. The evangelist is not called to scatter. The, the evangelist is called to gather. The, 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 the evangelist loves the unlovable and reaches the unreachable and teaches the unteachable. I'm teaching in this place. The evangelist goes where others. I, I believe the evangelist is a spiritual first responder. He's the first on the scene. She's the first on the scene. Come on, somebody. Are you an evangelist tonight? The next gift is the pastor. The pastor. All these gifts work together. To build the ministry. Are you learning something tonight? Yes. The evangelist gathers, but fourthly, the pastor, he guards. The pastor guards. The prophet guides. The prophet is moving people towards the vision. The prophet is preaching unpopular messages that are getting the feathers stirred up. Come on, somebody. But I believe the prophet is also a motivator as well. But the pastor, he guards the people. He guards the people. Remember on Sunday I told you that I'm not just a pastor? Are you understanding why now? Are you understanding why now? See, a pastor guards the people. The pastor knows, watch this, where the green pastures are. That when the sheep are in a dry and weary land and they're not eating and they're malnourished, the pastor knows exactly where to lead the sheep to eat. Come on, somebody. It's like, you know, you're in a foreign town or a different city and you're starving and you're like, where's in and out The pastor knows exactly where in and out is. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And I came to tell you that's the role of a pastor. The role of a pastor is to not only guide his people, but... He, he has to know how to lead them to a place of success in their life. A pastor has to know how to lead them to victory, lead them to strength, lead them to power, lead them to break. Are you with me so far? The pastor also knows how to heal and nurture those that are hurting. The pastor knows how to take time with people. See, see I, I, I talk to so many people that say I'm called by God, but you don't love people. You know, so how are you going to do ministry unless you develop a pastor's heart? The pastor knows how to, the, the pastor carries about around a bottle of oil in their pocket. Come on, somebody. Carries around a bottle of oil in their pocket, and when someone's sick, he pours the oil on them. When someone's discouraged, he pours the oil on them. See, we got a, we got a, lot, of, uh, uh, we got a lot of churches filled with motivators, but not pastors inspirational teachers but not pastors and we need some pastors to rise up in our midst you know what the pastors do the evangelist gathers 
But then the pastors protect the harvest. The evangelist is not called to take care of you. He's just called to get you in the house. Come on, somebody. But once he gets you in the house, he's got to hand you off to somebody that's going to care for you, that's going to love you, that's going to encourage you, that's going to counsel you, that's going to heal you, that's going to lay hands on you, that's going to answer the call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Come on, somebody. How many are grateful for pastors in your life? And then the last gift is the teacher. The apostle governs, the prophet guides, the evangelist gathers, the pastor guards, but then the teacher, he, he grounds the people. He grounds the people. That's why I'm taking time here tonight to teach you this thing, because sometimes we have to operate in the office of a teacher. Because when you teach people the word of God, what does it do? It develops roots within their life. You know why some people didn't graduate high school? Because they didn't like to go to class. Come on, don't look at me like that. Some of you didn't graduate. <laughs> and I came to tell you, if you want to grow up, you got to show up. Yeah. Facebook's not your teacher. Instagram and Twitter is not your teacher. How many of church and your pastors and your leaders are your teachers tonight? Come on, give God a good praise if you know that this is a year where you're going to get more grounded than ever. You know what good teaching does for the believer? It stabilizes their life. The Bible says that we're not called to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And what does the teacher do? The teacher takes the word of God, imparts the word of God into the people. The teacher begins to ground the believer in the promises of God, ground the believer in the values and principles of God. And when the storms begin to blow, and when the winds begin to come, and when the hurricane begins to hit your life, guess what? Because you're rooted, nothing will by any means move you. You'll stand firm. Jesus said, build your house on the rock. Come on, somebody. And the teacher knows and teaches you how to build your life on the rock. How many of you stand on the rock tonight? How many say, I'm growing, I'm becoming everything God has called me to be? See, what am I saying to you tonight is each and every one of us has a calling. Tell your neighbor, you have a calling. Each and every one of us need to understand that if God has called you, you need to carry something in your life. You need to carry something in your life. Answering the call to ministry is not just about preaching skill. It's not just about image. It's not hype. You have to carry something. You have to carry something called the anointing of God. Oh, come on, somebody. You have to carry an anointing that wherever you go, come on, somebody, things get better because you're involved in it. <laughs> you want to be a pastor, you want to be a minister, you want to be a leader. Wherever you go, things have to get better because you're there. Come on, somebody. And I need to teach you this because some people... They, they, wanna, they, they got a gift, but they don't know how to get a group together. <laughs> they got a gift to preach, but they can't gather a group. They can't get a disciple. They can't find one person to work with. This is too real for you? They're faithful to church. They think, just because I'm here, I'm a leader. I came to tell you, if you're called to ministry, where are your disciples? <laughs> it's too strong for some of you tonight. A leader who doesn't have disciples is just taking a walk. Come on, somebody. And a lot of people, they, they think that God's called them because they have a gift. But the problem is you don't carry a spirit of breakthrough. There's two ways to lead. You can lead by force or you can lead by inspiration. Come on, somebody. When you're in the home, they're leading you by force. Get in the van. Come on, somebody. 
Follow, listen, obey without whining. Flow. Come on, somebody. Someone say force. But if you really want to be effective in a church like Victor Arts San Diego, I see so many people come from other Victor Arts churches, other cities, and, and they struggle in our setting. They say, I don't, it's too hard, it's too big. And the reason is because in your old church, they taught you to lead by force, but here we teach you how to lead by inspiration. Oh, come on, somebody. You can lead by force or you can lead by inspiration. I want my life to be an inspiration to others. I want people to know that when they look at me, I'm carrying something in my life. I've been tested. I've been through the trials. I've been faithful. I've been trained. I, I, I've been through the process of God. And I want my life to be an inspiration to them. I can't lead everybody, but I can lead those that are looking to me because I'm walking in power. I'm walking in my calling. I'm walking in my... To come on, somebody. I could force you to follow me, but there's no guarantee you'll continue. Come on, somebody. But if my life is an inspiration, are you guys learning something tonight? If, watch this, if I keep growing, if I go from level to level to level to level to level, Every time I look back, there should be some people right there behind me. I feel like this is too heavy for some of you, but how many are with me? Can you clap for the Lord if you're with this message? I think some of you are like, I don't get it. It's all right. This is the message God gave me. Inspiration or force. In this church, we don't lead by force. We don't make you do stuff. Come on, somebody. We want you to obey. We want you to be obedient. We feel we're leading you to green pastures. But well, you don't got to listen. Some of you. And that's why you're always in a dry and weary land. But I want to hang out where the green grass is. I want to hang out where everybody's growing. I want to hang out where everybody's going to another level. I want to hang out where everybody's getting stronger. I, I want to know what you're eating so I can eat it too. Come on, somebody. Your life is an inspiration to me. I see how God is raising you up. I see how God is breaking you through. How can I get involved in that? How can I get a hold of my calling? How can I get a hold of my destiny? But you can't force people to listen. Are you hearing me tonight? See, I believe that we need to raise up and train leaders here that are visionary and inspirational. If you're going to be launched out from this church, you must be visionary. You must be inspirational. And you must be stable. If you haven't even learned to tithe, don't even ask to get sent out. <laughs> Because we're not sending out poverty people. Yeah. We're sending out breakthrough people. Yeah. We're sending out people that understand how to bring the breakthrough wherever they go. You get some tonight? Yeah. I'm almost done. Did you feel this was good? Yeah. There are seven things Jesus did to develop the cult. Seven things he did. How many of you feel like God is calling you? Wait, wave at me. Let me see you feel. Yeah, that's good. Jesus developed his men seven ways. Number one, Jesus selected them. He chose them. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Notice that he chose them. They did not choose him. We got to get that. <laughs> We got to work out that thinking in some people, man. Some people think that you're choosing to come to church. You're choosing to serve God. And that's why you have a generation that thinks that they're doing God a favor. <laughs> and God's saying, listen, buddy, you didn't choose me. I chose you. You didn't decide to follow me. I wooed you through the power of the Holy Ghost. I birthed you in the church. I birthed you in the ministry. I birthed you in the calling. You did not choose me. I chose you. I stamped you. I put my hand on your life. I separated you. Come on, give God a praise if you're grateful that he chose you tonight. Come on, give him a strong praise. I'm preaching good and teaching good. See, those who are called feel that God has called them to do a work and they're willing to follow him. Secondly, Jesus... He not only selected them, but he consecrated them. The word consecrate means to separate, to separate. 
Meaning he, he pulled them away from the crowd. He called them to live away from the crowd, to live away from the people they were normally hanging with. It's so critical. It's so critical. Because if you're not willing to separate yourself from your old life, you'll never answer the call of God. And he separated them, but he went with them. He spent time with them. And what did he do when he spent time with them? He exposed himself to them. And he taught them how to pray. And he taught them how to be holy and separate from the world. And here's what I believe. If if you're called, I believe God still moves through clean vessels. You know, God still moves through clean, clean vessels. If you really want the anointing and you really want to have power in your ministry, you, you have to be a clean vessel. I still believe that you, you've got to pray, you've got to separate, you've got to fast, you've got to live holy. Come on, somebody. You've got to strive to be separate. Now, we're living in a day where, you know, not everybody's doing that, and they're still doing things in ministry, but you notice that they don't have power. You'll notice they don't have power. They call themselves Christians, but they don't have power. They don't have the anointing. Yes, they're saved, they're rescued by the blood of Jesus, but there's no power in them. And if you're called by God... You need to be a clean vessel so that God could pour out his strong anointing through your life. Does anybody believe like your pastor here tonight? Does anybody believe this way? Come on, somebody. We need some clean vessels. The third thing is that he imparted into them. I want to tell you that Jesus didn't just teach them. He didn't give them three points in a poem. Come on, somebody. How many know that discipleship is intense and intentional? Not everybody can survive discipleship. Not everybody can survive answering the call. Because when you determine you're called, the heat goes up. The preaching gets stronger. The the impartation gets stronger. Why? Jesus, the Bible says that when Jesus had his disciples, the Bible says he breathed on them. (laughs) What was he trying to do? He was trying to get everything inside of him into them. Come on, somebody. That's what I feel like doing to some of you, man. Come here. (laughs) That would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? But Jesus was trying to impart into them. He exposes till to them. And you know what he did? He didn't spare the rod in challenging them personally. If you're called by God, he's going to deal with you. He's going to shape you. He's going to mold you. He told Peter after he walked on water, man, what a powerful Powerful thing to do to walk on water. You know, he was the only one that stepped out of the boat, but then he sank. And I'm the type of leader that I probably would have said, good job, Peter. Great job, man. At least you stepped out, man. You took a few steps on the water. But Jesus said, where's your faith? Come on, somebody. Where's your faith, man? You were doing so well. Jesus didn't spare the rod. He wasn't afraid to challenge his disciples personally. He wasn't afraid to take them to another level. Listen, if you're going to get to your calling, you got to let people challenge you. you got to let God challenge you. you got to let the word of God impart into you. The fourth thing he did is he he demonstrated before them. We're talking about how Jesus developed the call. Are you with me tonight? He demonstrated power. He modeled power in his ministry. See, Jesus didn't just preach. He healed the sick. Jesus didn't just preach. He healed the sick. In fact, Jesus was actually an innovator. An innovator. Because the Bible says that he went to every town and village healing the sick, restoring the lame, Opening up blind eyes. Nobody was doing that. Come on, somebody. And that's why I got to tell you, if if you're going to reach your generation, you're going to need to innovate. You're going to need some power. You're not going to be able to stand on the corner and protest and yell in a bullhorn. No, no, no. When people get around you, they're going to have to feel something. Come on, somebody. 
When they get around you, they're going to have to feel something. When they come into contact you, they're going to have to see something about you. Can I hear an amen? When Jesus was going through the towns and villages, you've seen the drama on Easter. There was that woman that had all those demons. Man, she just got into the room and then started manifesting and fell down. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that Peter was packed with so much power that the people wanted just to stand in his shadow to get healed. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about the call of God. Because we're going to raise up some leaders that wherever you go, you're going to bring revival. You're going to bring breakthrough. You're going to take it to another level. Come on, somebody. But you're going to have to have evidence in your ministry. When John the Baptist heard about Jesus, he was in prison. And, and he sent his disciples. He, he said, go ask him if he's the Messiah. And Jesus didn't give him his title. In fact, he never called himself the son, of, uh, the son of God once. He never called himself the Messiah one time when he walked on the earth. Not once. He sent John a message and he told him, you tell John that the blind see, that the lame walk, that the leper is healed. That's all he had to tell him. Basically, what he was telling him is this. He says, you tell him there's evidence. Come on, somebody. You tell them there's power. And John knew immediately, he knew immediately that he was the son of God. My question is, if you're called by God, do you have power flowing out of your life? The fourth thing is he delegated to them. The fifth thing. In other words, Jesus didn't keep the power to himself. But how many know that when God calls you, he gives you his power? He's looking not only to pour revival on you, he's looking to pour revival through you wherever you go. He's looking for a people that would actually hunger for his power. The disciples, he put them two by two and he gave them power and he sent them out. And what, when he sent them out, the Bible says they came back, look at this, with a good report. Someone say good report. Good report. I, I can always tell those who are called based on the report they give. I can always tell the ones that are breaking through based on their testimony. You give them the microphone and they don't talk about their problems. They talk about their breakthrough. Yeah. They don't talk about where they've been. They talk about where they're going. You, you, so you give them the microphone to testify about the ministry. It's not the same testimony year in and year out. They're going from level to level to level. They come back with a good report. Come on, somebody. And I really believe with all my heart that when you hunger... For the power of God in your life, then you will come back with a good report. You will experience miracles in your ministry. You will grow your Bible study. You will grow the youth gang. You will grow everything that you touch. Why? Not because you're so great, but because the power of God is moving through you. The next thing is that he supervised them. He gave them power, but then he watched them while they work. He watched them while they worked. And when, when he saw how they worked and when they got into the wrong spirit, he corrected them. He taught them not to rejoice over the wrong things. Because when they came back with the good report, they said, even the demons tremble. Come on, somebody. He said, even the demons tremble. And then he says, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You know what Jesus is really telling them and what Jesus is telling some of you who feel called? He's saying, stay humble. Stay humble. It's not you. It's not your talent. It's not your ability. You're just a clean vessel that God is moving through. Come on, give God a good praise if you're grateful for it. See, some of you, you don't get excited about that, but the ones that want to be used will catch this tonight. Then he reproduced himself in them. And they went and reproduced themselves in others. As I bring it to a close tonight, when we think about the call of God, I really wanted to slow down and teach this tonight. Because I believe with all my heart that God is calling some of you, but we have to get clear on the calling. We need to understand the different gifts and the different roles. And if you're going to get the right result, 
You need to have the right leaders moving in the right places. Yeah. If we're going to get the right result, we need the right leaders. Watch this. Moving in the right spirit. Yeah. We need leaders that are secure in their calling. Mm -hmm. if, if you have one of those 18 gifts, you've got to be secure in that gift. I want to tell you the call of God goes out to all. But not everyone's called to lead. God called the entire children of Israel to freedom, but it was Moses that was going to lead them there. God anointed Saul to be king. But the real results didn't come until David stepped into the office. We're all called to be disciples, but we're not all called to lead. But if you do feel that you are called by God to lead, I, I got to tell you, and I think this is so important. And this could be the difference between success and failure in your ministry. Can I talk about it? Yeah. Is you need to have power in your preaching. And in order to have power in your preaching, you need to be a weeping preacher. You need to learn to be broken for the people that you're trying to lead. If you want to have success. If you want to have a surface thing, then just keep doing what you're doing. But if you want real ministry and real breakthrough in people's lives, you have to break for the people. You have to love the people so much and be so broken over their condition that it comes out of you. That it comes out of you. And when you're so broken for the people, you're not trying to win a popularity contest. You're just trying to get people out of that situation. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Give God a praise right now. If your house is on fire and all your kids in there, I'm not going to go in there and say, would you mind walking out of here? No. I'm going to go in there violently. And I'm going to grab those kids and I'm going to pull them out. I'm going to say amen. And that's what ministry is. Ministry is not being polite, putting on a show. No. Ministry is when you're willing to go into a burning building and pull people out of the fires of hell. But how many know you, you won't do it without brokenness? You won't do it without love. You won't do it without compassion. You won't do it without a heart for people. And I believe this is so important tonight. I'm going to ask you to stand. Because God is always separating the leaders from the followers. The Bible says desire the good gifts. Paul says, be zealous for God. But understand there's a price for effectiveness. There's a price for effectiveness. What I'm believing is going to happen is that in this third wave of our church, we're going to start seeing some powerful preachers rise up. We're going to start seeing some leaders that when they get behind the pulpit, they're not just going to talk to you. They're not going to just say, oh, open your Bible. And, no, 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 no. We're going to see some people get behind this pulpit that have a heart for the broken. We, we're going to have some people that are going to be an inspiration. That they're not going to force you to lead and force you to follow they're going to inspire you to follow. That you're going to look at their life and you're going to say, that person is such an inspiration. I have to do all I can to get close to that leader. I got to do all I can to get close to that leader because that leader carries something heavy in their life. Young people, understand me. Maybe the youth is not breaking through because you guys aren't carrying nothing. You're not carrying anything. You don't have anything. Nothing inside of you. 
You speak, but there's no power in it. You speak, but people are not affected by what you're saying because you're preaching from your head, but you're not preaching from your heart. Think about the results you want. Chula Vista, man, I sense hard over there. But you know what? We, we've got to step in. We've got to step it up. If, if this message spoke to you, it may not be for everybody. I want you to come to this altar right now. And I, and I want you to begin to think about your heart and think about your ministry. And begin to think about God's calling in your life. And, and I feel a prayerful spirit tonight. I feel a prayerful spirit tonight. I feel like we don't need to shout. We don't need to get into all that. I, I think we need to say, God, break me for souls. I want to be a weeping preacher. I want to be a passionate preacher. I want to be a leader who's passionate. I, I can still remember when I was lost. I can still remember when I was bound. I can still remember when I didn't have any hope and somebody prayed for me. Somebody weep for me. Somebody had a passion for me. Father, deal with my heart tonight. I don't want to be a performance leader. I want to have power in my life. I want to have power in my life, oh God. I want to impart to the people that you've called me to lead. I, I want to impart to them. I, I want to be an inspiration to them. I want to walk heavy in the house of God. I want to walk heavy everywhere I go. I'm, I'm called to be that apostle. I'm called to be that prophet. I'm called to be that pastor, that evangelist, that teacher. And I'm going to dedicate myself to that calling tonight. Just let them begin to deal with your heart tonight and understand that the calling is serious. People are dying every day. People are going to hell every day. Marriages are breaking up every day. Young people are being killed in the streets every day. And they need a messenger. They need somebody that's going to move in tears and move with compassion like never before. So right now, I want you just to say, Lord, I want you to break me once again. Break me once again. Break me once again. Break me, Lord. That's it. Fall on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. I know you're called me. I know you're chosen me. Lord, I need your power in my life. I want to be a power preacher. I want to be a power discipler. I want to be a power leader, God. Fall 